Nate Smith. If you think you've seen Forged in Fire, you ain't seen nothing yet. Pay attention to the details. Fire's in my heart again. Hot boys. I'm in trouble. Don't swear your mother's watching. I'm so glad I wasn't brown pants. <laughs> this forge of fire, it's not gonna be easy. Woo! Get ready. The heat is on. Good luck. You're gonna need it. Forged in fire. New episodes return Tuesday at 9 on History. Maybe you can just speak. Okay. Speak. Um, yeah, let's let try next. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Sorry about <laughs> all the technological issues. So I was saying that this show kind of really hooked me the first time I came across because it reminded me of, of this forge um, that I used to go when I was a kid. So, um, and, and you see, oops, but, um, oops. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I accidentally. Um... Yeah, so um, those two kids, I mean, the reason why those kids are smiling is because of they are among themselves. Because if you are among the adults and you have to fan the flame all day long, it gets really tiring. So at the end of the day, you, you don't quite smile. Uh, but here, I mean, because they are among themselves, it's they can enjoy doing uh, learning stuff on their own. So, so I got really hooked to, to this, uh, this uh, because it, it brought back to me um, those childhood memories. And so just to say a bit about the West African um, uh, society, I think in many uh, places in West Africa, the, it, the society is kind of organized by caste. And so by birth, I was kind of, of this caste called the blacksmith caste, which is called Numu in Malenke and or Bambara, if you prefer. And in Sonufo, it's called Fono. Um, so, and what that means is that um, that's one of the trades that I should have done um, if I grew up to be what I should have been, you see. But so when I was in high school, I kind of went back um, during the summer holiday, I would go to the forge and try to, to maybe um, try to make knives, kitchen knives and sell them to make a bit of money. Um, so that's one of the reasons. And this really reminded me of, of, of that childhood. The process is very similar to what you see in Forge and Fire, if you are a bit familiar with the, 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 the show, uh, except for the modern equipment that they are using. So, so basically what I'm, saying is that um, by birth, I was destined to be a blacksmith or a numo, if you prefer. Unfortunately, when I was about nine years old, I had polio. I mean, so again, this is probably one of the things that the lot of people don't know, but unfortunately, this virus still exists in few places. So I caught the virus when I was about nine, nine months old. So which means that, I mean, it would have been challenging to, to become um, a blacksmith, at least that's uh, what um, my parents thought at the time. But even then, my dad didn't want to send me to school. He still thought that somehow 
maybe there's a hope I would still become the, the blacksmith or something like that. But as you will see later, the person, there was someone who was very instrumental who finally convinced my dad to send me to school. So, so that's how I, I guess you could say that that's how I end up in front of you guys today telling you about uh, this story. Um, so, so that's the part of the forge in fire. So when I say, if I have to describe myself in two words, the first word would be forge in fire. So now you see the connection with that. And the second one is William Kawemba. Have you, so I guess none of you have heard about the, the book of the boy who harvests the wind. No, oh, you, okay, you do it, yeah. Uh, oh, it's a film, okay. I only know about the book, I don't know about the film. So yeah, so this this is William Kawemba. Uh, he doesn't look like this anymore. He's a, he's a grown up man. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, the story about uh, William Kawemba is that he dropped out of school because his parent couldn't afford to 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 pay to 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 pay it. And of course, I mean, he was a very curious child, so he still wanted to keep up his education. And so, in order to do that, he would go to the local library and read stuff um, to learn himself. And then he kind of stumbled on the picture of a windmill. And, and decided that he was going to build his own windmill. And, and when he did this, um, the story kind of went viral, you see. So the first he was shown on the local media. And then I remember seeing it um, on international uh, media talking about him. And uh, just to see how, how famous he became, he, he even gave a talk at TED, you know, this uh, thing where they invite quite serious people to tell about the life accomplishment. So he gave a talk and he actually ended up doing a degree at Dartmouth College, right? So, so, so um, this is uh, William uh, Kawamba's uh, windmill. So, <laughs> so as you can see, it has quite a, I mean, all the kind of stuff you could find and try and make this um, windmill uh, uh, by himself. And so the, the reason I mentioned him is that this reminded me also of part of my childhood because I was quite curious about science and mathematics. And I know that for a fact, I was really passionate about those two things. And then for example, in high school, um, I remember that at the beginning of the year, I mean, I would go through my, my books of um, uh, physics and I'll read the book from cover to cover before the term even starts. And then, of course, then I'll become really frustrated because there is no other way for me to learn extra stuff. And, and so when I kind of read this story, it, it reminded me again of, of that kind of childhood. So in saying, essentially, you do have a lot of kids that want to go to school. They are passionate about learning new stuff, but sometimes the, the resources are not just there. And, and, and it really leads to a to, to lot of frustration at times. So, so that's basically the, the connection with, with um, um, William Kawemba that I um, wanted to mention. Um, and now I'm going to, so basically what I'm going to do now, I'm going to tell you, um, the, 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 I'm going to tell you about the, the people who kind of inspired me to, to, to get to this point and to talk to you about the kind of research that I do. And um, the, the, the next thing that I'm going to do is um, talk about what I call the Newton experiment on di dispersion of light, um, if you prefer the God saber. And so, so this is kind of remind me of, of my mom who, um, I mean, so in two, exactly two weeks time, it would be three, three years since my mom passed away, but, um, of course it's challenging, but one thing that I remember about my mom is her sense of humor. I like to believe that I have a good sense of humor and I think that sense of humor comes from her. And that's why I'm going to tell you about this episode that um, happened in my, my childhood. So, and before I, I talk to, I want to ask you, I'm sure the students in this room, probably many of them were too young to remember this, but how many of you remember this weird figure by the, the atomic collider? Because some people thought that 
there would be a big bang and then it will swallow the earth. And so if you read the, the, the last paragraph here, that says, on August 26, Otto Russell, a German chemist at the Eberhard Karis University in Tübingen, filed a lawsuit against CERN in the European Court of Human Rights. That is, <laughs> so the, the, the lawsuit argued that you know under statement, that you know under statement that such a scenario would violate the right to the life of the European citizens and pose a threat to the rule of law. <laughs> so that's how scared people were um, when they heard about um, the people at CERN trying to do the this experiment about the the, with the hydron collider. And, and so what I want to say uh, is that I had a mini version of this on my level with my mom, and and it's related to 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 the Newton experiment with the diaper the, the, the dispersion of light so this was one of the few experiments that i could do at home right so i would read the physics group but very often there are not that many so this one the the way it was described in my physics book i could do the experiment so a sunday afternoon i was busy cutting so i had to cut a card box to form a screen and then have a hole in that and then they said to fill a, a transparent bottle with water and then use that to reflect the light. So I was very busy doing this stuff. And then my mom, she, she comes, I mean, because somehow every time I was doing this kind of experiment, she, she always fear for the worst somehow. And um, so she asked me, um, what are you doing? And then, I, I mean, so I was, I know she might have, she might ask me the question, but I wasn't I didn't know how to explain to her that I was doing a physics experiment about dispersion of light. So the first thing that came to mind, I told her I was trying to create a God saber because God saber is the term for Rambo in Malenke and Senufo. So so she kind of looked me very anxious. Do you want to create a God saber? I said, yes, <laughs> and then I burst into laughing because she, she, I mean, she was expecting that, yeah, maybe my, I mean, you have to put yourself in my mom's shoes, right? I mean, she's, she's never been to school and people tell her that the, the rainbow is more than what it is. So she thought that if I create a God saber, who knows what that God saber would do to, 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 to us, but, um, so when I started laughing, she, 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 she realized that it was, of course, silly to, to react that way. But that's the, the, the kind of um, fun memories that I have because, I mean, for most of my experience, you always expected the worst, but um, we always end up laughing because when she realized that she was overreacting and it was silly, we always end up laughing. So, so this was one of those experiments. Um, Sorry, nothing, I think. Yeah. You logged out on Zoom. Oh, uh, this one? Possibly because I don't see you oh. on on Zoom anymore. You mean the, on on my on this one? Here? Yeah. But I think I'm still. I got a message. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know why. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Maybe I should have. Uh, I'm afraid. G16. Seven. Oh, what is it? Uh, not sure. Nine three. Sorry, everyone. I'm not sure why it's disconnected. Pass by six eight six one nine four. Six eight six one nine four. Um, I think maybe when you. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Right? Um, yeah. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, so so this um experiment always make me smile every time I think mm -hmm. about it. Um but it's also it's so not you still need to uh mm -hmm. you still oh, need no. to share your screen. <laughs> <laughs> so many things. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so. So I mentioned this because it, I mean, as I said, it's, it's one of those things to kind of illustrate um, the interest that I have in science early on. And, but the thing that I want to mention now, which I think is probably the, the most important is the, the role that mentorship played in, in, in my life, because without some of that mentorship, I don't think I would have been here. Um, so, these are basic, I mean, I could have given you a long list of people who had um, some influence in, on, in my life, but really the three people who have the most influence in my life is the three that are listed now. So Mr. Kone, uh, Madame Francoise Denis, and I call him Mr. Jacques Resch. So at lunch, we were talking about professors and students, how formal you, <laughs> it was back then. Um, so yeah, I grew up in a place where you have to be very formal. So it's it's always Mr. Kone, um, Madame, I mean, Monsieur. <laughs> so so even now, I think if I those people, I keep calling them by 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 Monsieur, Madame. So they, they were the most influential people in um, in my life, and. Um, but before I tell you about, I mean, this talk is not supposed to be boring. So I'm trying to find ways to make it a bit more exciting. So I'm going to give you a crash course in African culture. Um, and for that, I'm going to start by showing you some of the cereal that you've never heard about. So th this cereal is the mille. So if you see it on the farm, it's really green. It's very beautiful. You see um, the, um, how it looks. And um, so this is one of the cereal that you find in a lot of West African countries. The, the next type of cereal that you find in the, is the, the, what we call sorgo, which I think here would look a bit like barley, right? Um, and on, again, on, when you see those in the farm, it's so bright red and you can take really nice picture because it's it quite, um, the, the, the red is quite striking, but when you remove the skin, then you get something which is pretty white. And the the one that one of the cereal that is very specific to West Africa, which is kind of striking, is what we call fonio. So you see, in the hand of that guy, you would swear that it's it's kind of sand, right? If you look at it, it's almost like sand. But when you remove the 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 the, the thin layer then you get something which is quite uh, bright. I mean, it's relatively white. It look a bit like couscous and this is actually a super food. So I think now if you go to New York or some big cities and you want to eat super food, they will probably tell you that the fonio is one of those super food, um, but pro, you've never heard about it. Um, but that's the, a the, the, lot of um, fonio in uh, New York would, is produced in Senegal. Okay, so um, the, so the reason why I told you about those cereals, and you would see the connection with uh, Mr. Kone very shortly, is that those cereals that I showed you, they are, they are used to brew traditional beer. So you would use the, the mille or the sorgo to brew traditional beer. And again, because it's a caste system, the people who just brew the beer are women. So it, it's a, a, a way to earn income uh, for women. The only um, exception in that case is what is palm wine. So first of all, if you want some word in Malenke, um, that traditional beer is called dolo um, in Malenke, or uh, sim in, in Sonufo, if, if you, you, you want a crash course in those. <laughs> um, and um, so 
So except for palm wine, beer is tried, made usually by women. And I think the, the only reason why it's uh, kind of maybe reserved to men to make palm wine is because of the way you make palm wine. So you have to extract the sap from palm tree. And usually you have to climb up out of the way to the top to the palm of the palm tree and then collect the sap. It's a bit like when you want to make maple syrup, but you can collect the maple syrup at the bottom of the tree. But in this case, you really have to go to, otherwise the, what you get, it, it will not be, a, it doesn't taste anything actually. And, and so um, the only picture that I could find on the internet is this one. But at the same time, you see, there are really a lot of things wrong with this picture. <laughs> because the, the guy is collecting the stuff with plastic bottle, which are kind of an old one. So, but traditionally, this is not what people use. I thought the picture was kind of hilarious. That's why I, I use, traditionally they use gourds to collect the, which is more of environmental friendly. And, um, and the palm wine is actually good. I, I think there are a few places where I've, when I was in Canada, there were a few places where I could find palm wine, but I don't know here, maybe in London, but I'm not sure. Um, so the reason why I mentioned this is basically, the, so Mr. Kone, who I told you was the, my first mentor, he used to come to, 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 to our place to, to drink his traditional beer. And he was a headmaster in a local school. So every time he comes to have some of that beer, he, he would talk to my dad. And so, and then he would he keep insisting that my dad send me to school. And even though that my dad was very um not very open to the idea, he kept insisting over and over. And finally, that's how I got to go to school. So, so, so in that sense, it was. Re I see him as my first mentor because after I was in school, I always went to him to, if I need any help. So he was really instrumental in 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 my early education, and and so if it wasn't for that traditional beer that he liked and he came to our family, <laughs> that encounter would never happen. Um, yeah. So finally, he did manage to convince my dad to, to send me to school. So um, then I went to um, so college and he said, so college in French is a high school. I know it would be, a, it's a bit confusing. So if you say college in French, it means high school. But I know in English, college means uh, higher education. So the, the college in French, it's lycée. Okay, I think I've uh, managed to confuse you enough, but uh, that's 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 the word. So, in so in in those two places, the the people that were really instrumental in my um, life is um, uh, Madame Denise and um, Monsieur Jacques Rech. So the first one was both the the, the first one was my physics professor um, in in high school. She was a French expat. And Mr. Jacques Rech was also a French expert. So, um, but he was my um, my physics professor a bit later on. And um, and I would say that they really did everything. They saw that I was very passionate about science because I was always, I mean, even though students normally didn't do that, I all I would go to the house and then pepper them with questions about things that I didn't understand and and they didn't mind me coming to to them and, and asking them so so i mean the resources weren't always there but they were at least open to 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 answering my questions and and so they were really instrumental um in um in my in that part of my education um, and i still manage to keep in touch with um i mean of course they are a bit old now but i didn't I, do manage to keep in touch with um, uh, some of, by the way, Jacques Resch is very, um, I mean, he likes physics, but so you wouldn't be surprised that he's advised me against doing that, <laughs> becoming a mathematician, but but I did it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, so just to a, a 
some kind of anecdote to illustrate how those people were important in my life is, so I used to go around town to kind of collect old radios and then I will harvest the, the component so that I can build, because I was also quite passionate about electronics. So, so I'll basically go and harvest. So when I told you the connection with William Kawemba, that's one reason. So I will harvest the, the component and then I'll build my own stuff. And I remember how excited I was the first time I had a proper kit of toolbox to do electronic. And that tool came from, from Jacques Rech. Um, he, he got that tool from one of his um, colleague who was going back to, to France for good. And so I finally had this set and I was so excited. I mean, I think that was probably the shortest summer because every morning I would wake up at maybe six, seven during my, so I didn't want the summer to 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 be over, but but I had to go back to school. Um, so so yeah, so so that's how influential those uh, people were um, in my life. So there are actually people who know Jacques Rech for other reason. Is that is is a French surrealist painting, and and I think it's quite well known in the the circle. So these are some of his his painting for those of you who want to know a bit more about his work. So if you ever buy one of those uh, painting and you want someone to authenticate, you, you because I did see him painting those when, <laughs> so I might, <laughs> I might be able to do that for you. But anyway, um, this is just a, um, a side. So, so I'm going to conclude this first part of my talk because I, I want to, so what, what do I want you to, to take away from, from this, uh, this talk? It's the following thing. So, I mean, I grew up in, in the Savannah of West Africa. And of course, there are a lot of differences with someone growing up in, in those savannas and a kid that is growing up in Europe or Canada or US. But I think there are still a lot of common denominators when it comes to under representation in science and mathematics. Uh, for example, if you talk to many kids from underrepresented background, the first thing they'll say, they'll tell you, ah, I'm, I'm the first kids uh, from my family to go to uni. I mean, we are in the north of uh, the UK, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, people who were traditionally from certain background in the north, Many of those kids, they are still the first kids to, in their family to go to, to, to school. So, 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 so you have those common denominators that you have to keep in mind. And one thing that I, I think I re want to repeat as many times as I can is that I wasn't the brightest kid in my, my class. If I tell you that, that would be a lie. But I think all things considered, I was probably one of the luckiest. You could say, yeah, okay, I had polio when I was young, but probably if I didn't have polio, I would be a, a blacksmith back in the Ivory Coast and I've never traveled the world. So all things considered, I, I was one of the luckiest. And because there are people who saw some potential in me and then they nurture my passion for science and mathematics. And so what I want you guys to be is, I want you to be the Mr. Kone, the Madame Denis, or the Mr. Jacques Rech to some kids. So, so that's the thing that I want you to, to, to get from this talk. Because um, thanks to those people, I, it did allow me to acquire a certain amount of knowledge and to travel the world um, as a globe, mathematical globe trotter, if you wish. So, so that's what I want you to, to, to get from this talk, that you can always make the difference in the life of some kids. You just have to keep your eye open. So, so th that's the first thing that I want you to conclude this part of my talk. Oh, how much time I have left? I think you still have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, late, so. Perfect, yeah. So now, I'm going to talk about um, the work that I do uh, as a mathematician. So again, they wanted me to make this into a colloquium talk. So I'm not, I mean, I try to make, I try to make it as basic as I can. So um, 
Um, so I start from Muhammad Al Fulani Magic Square to Gauss Quadratic Residue. I should say maybe to Langland program. I mean, I guess I meant to say quadratic reciprocity law. But so, so I think this really. So when I say it's a tale of a mathematical globe trotter, I mean I think this 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 the influence of those of. Uh, people do appear in the kind of stuff that I do. So to be honest, I, I only came across Muhammad Al-Fulani Al-Kishwani very recently. I didn't know about him. So it's my UK friend who actually told me about his existence. So, <laughs> and so, and I was kind of amused when I saw his name, right? Because you see, the, the, this is actually very, I mean, for you guys, this doesn't. This is telling you where he's from. I mean, his ethnic background. So in West Africa, there are the Fulani. They are nomadic people who have traveled almost all over West Africa. So they have their cattle, and then they travel around. So he was from that background. And then, so what this? I mean, we actually don't know much about his life, but he he, he grew up in the north of the the of Nigeria on the 17th century. And then he went to, to the Mecca. Um, and I think in, the, in his way back, he settled in Egypt where he died. Um, so, so when I saw his, his, this name, I automatic, so it's, I mean, it's, you know that this is a very typical West African name. So, um, so I was struck by that and I was kind of surprised that I never, I hadn't known about this guy until my friend told me about him. And, and so what we know about him is that he did a lot of work on uh, magic squares. In fact, that's the main reason why I'm talking to you about him. And then he, he was actually quite well reputed uh, in that area. But of course he wasn't, I mean, you could argue that he wasn't doing this primarily as a mathematician but he was doing it because he had some interest in astrology and numerology, right? So, so that's why he was um, interested in those magic squares. So building some of those magic square kind of give you some recipe to do certain, to get some superpower and things like that. Um, and and so, so he has a, some manuscript where he actually talk about this. And I think that I'm not, I mean, I, I can find a reference. I, I forgot the, the, the name of the, the, the library, but there is the copies of this manuscript in, in, of his work um, in, in some of those library. And if you want to summarize his work in modern terms, you could say that his work kind of uh, touch on group theory and topology. At, at least you would see um, by some of the things that I'm going to, to mention, but before that, I'm going to, to, to kind of recall what a um, magic square is. So if you remember about a magic square, you take, um, it's an N by N cell, and you want to fill those cells with um, whole numbers such that all the rows, the column, and the main diagonal, they sum up to the same, uh, to the same number. So for example, if you look at the, what I have on the, on the left, I have uh, the old Arabic numerals. And then on the right, we have uh, the modern Arabic uh, numeral. And then you could see that everything here would sum up to 15. And, and this magic square is known uh, by the name Lo Shu because I guess uh, the Chinese also uh, did work on those uh, um, magic squares. And so, the, so how do, um, Al Fulani constructed those, those magic squares. I mean, so the recipe that I'm the recipe that I'm going to describe now is not the only one to have found this recipe. I think, uh, for example, this five by five magic square. There is, I think, is it Lubert or a French uh, French mathematician who also work on this. So he wasn't the only one, but he actually did some extensive work and he could build um, quite big magic square. I mean, I think he had work where he was he managed to build the 11 by 11 magic square, which was quite impressive at the time. So how did he usually constructed this magic square? 
So you start with um, you start with uh, a square five by five. So this is the center of your square. You place one here. And then what you do, you move one step to the right, one step down, and you put two. So you have one here, you have two here. And then what you do, you move one step here, and then you have to move one step down. But except you cannot go down because there is no square. So what you do, you loop around and you come here and you put three. And so you keep repeating that uh, process. So for, for, for three, I guess you go here and then you cannot go further. So you loop around and you put four here. Four, you would have five here. And then when you have five, you come here, one is already occupied. So you go, um, you go to, um, to, to, uh, step down and then you, you wrap up and you put seven here. Right? And then you keep going until you fill the, 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 the square. So that's the method that I use. Right? And if you, so basically what is, so when I say you can see this as touching some of the areas in, in modern mathematics, it's basically telling you, you have to think of your magic square as being drawn on a torus because you identify this with this and this with this. So, so when you, you, you think of this as you're writing your, your, your magic square on the torus, so when you get here and you, 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 when you go down and you, you flip and you, you, you hear what you are doing, you are really gluing this side and this one. And, 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 and now in modern terminology, we know that the the way you move those uh, those uh, squares, you are basically performing a permutation, which modern in modern world we call uh, uh, derangement or something like that. So so you could see that some of the stuff that it did is a kind of prelude to um, group theory, and of course the the connection with the torus that topology is that you can glue the the square and then you and draw on this. Um, and, and, and so that's basically how he constructed this. And for the, as I said, he, he constructed some nine by nine squares and also some 11 by 11, and this was quite laborious. And so, so in the manuscript is actually giving, making some pep talks to his students. So about the importance of being perseverant <laughs> and think so, I mean, some people say, ah, oh, maybe if you actually want to talk about his work, you could also mention the, important of persevering because that's the only way you can achieve success if you you want to do to mathematics because sometimes things can be challenging and you have to keep pushing so um and i mentioned briefly the reason why i think this he was interested in um, in the magic square magic squares I mean, this might be kind of controversial for some people, but for me, it's kind of natural that I make this. I think so. The 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 reference that I look at that they, they've said it's speculative to say that the reason he was interested in in magic square is because he was he wanted to use them to build the amulet. But if you grew up in the place where I grew up, you know that this is true. So people still believe in magic powers of uh, words and things like that. So, so I know that in places they would write some um, Quran verse and, and then try to make amulets with that. And, and so I know that, uh, so when I saw this, I said, yeah, of course, this is why the, the, he was doing this because people believe in, in, in those things. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so one of the reasons is really people use um, um, he was using the magic square, some kind of amulet where you, it's supposed to give you certain uh, uh, superpower and things like that. So, um, so that's the thing that I, I, so just to conclude this part is, so I remembered, I think the first time that I heard about magic squares was probably in high school. And incidentally, my math teacher in high school was from Guinea, where you have the biggest population of 
Fulanis in West Africa, and he was a Fulani from Guinea. So, I mean, so, so, um, I mean, that's just a coincidence, but um, I just wanted to mention uh, before concluding this part. So the, the, what I'm going to do, so this was something which incited my first curiosity in mathematics. And the next thing that I'm going to, to talk about, which relate to Gauss quadratic reciprocity law is um, some Diophantine problems. And so, I'm, so what is a Diophantine equation? It's simply a polynomial equation. So you have a polynomial in several variable. You want the polynomial to have integer coefficients. And what you are interested in are um, integer solution to this polynomial equation. So for example, the most famous Diophantine equation would be this Fermat equation. And you want integer solution to this. And the big theorem by Andrew Wild tells us there is no uh, there is no uh, integer solution to this, where all the um, the a b c where all a b c are all non-zero. Right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to so here are some just to show you some nice picture. I drew uh, the Fermat curve for several uh, numbers. But the one that I'm going to focus on for, for this part of my talk is what we call the Pythagoras equation. So the Pythagoras equation, we take n to be equal to, so which amount to basically looking at the solution of, um, of, of this uh, integer, uh, rational solution on this circle. And if you have a rational solution on this circle, you can clear the denominator. And when you clear the denominator, you get what we call a Pythagoras triplet. So um, three, four, five, for example. And in this case, you can actually write a parametric equation, which gives you the, the, all the solution to this Pythagoras um, uh, equation. And so in this case, we, we have a very good understanding of the solution, the integer solution of, of this, this equation when n equal two, right? So, um, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to look at this thing a bit more carefully. So if you want to look at the integer solution, we see that there are only four of them, right? So I listed them here. So the number of solution in that case is, I'll call it nz and it's equal to four. Now let's look at the, the real solution. So we know that the real solution will basically be all the points that live on the, on the circle. So we cannot really count the, that's those solution per se. But, so, but if you want to give some kind of measure to the number of solution, we could take the circumference of the circle as a measure. So I'm going to set that the, 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 the number of solution on, in the real is two pi. Now, so we look at the solution over the real, but there are some other fields for which we can look at the solution. So which are namely the, what we call the finite field. So for the prime P, the finite field of FP is the, basically the integer between zero and P minus one. So every integer is equal to its remainder module. Uh, when you divide it by P, it's equal to its remainder. So, um, so, so you would always end up with an integer between zero and P minus one. And that's, um, so those are the congruence classes. So this is a field and we can look at the solution of this equation in, in that field. So the set of solution would be uh, this one here. And what we can do, we can fix for, we can fix the X coordinate and find the y that are given by this. So this here is a disjoint union. So we have the disjoint union which depend on the x coordinate. And for that x coordinate, you find the possible y's. So, so, um, so if I want to count the number of solution, which I call NP, that number of solution would be uh, the solution for each x coordinate, right? Now let's, so we want to understand what 
for a given X, we want to understand the possible solution. So this number is of NP. And you see that, so if one, so we want to have Y, right? So Y will only exist if, if this is a square, one minus X is a square. And in this case, we see that, so if this is not a square, there is no solution. If this square is zero, there is one solution. If this square is non-zero, then you have two solutions. Right? So for each X coordinate, you can count the number of solutions. And then using this, you can actually make some heuristic. And this heuristics can, will tell you that if you look at all the integers between, so if you look at all the, the solution in here, half of them will be squares. Right, which means that because each one of those will give you two possible solutions, if half of them are square, then you the number of solutions you get in total roughly would be p, right? Because you have two times p over two, so this tells us that roughly the number of solution in the finite field, this number is roughly p, right? So it, there's a possibility that we are off. It's not exactly p but you expect that it will be very close to P. And what we are going to do, we are going to estimate how far off we are from, from, from P. And so if I call that error term AP, which is P minus the number of actual solution, what Gauss did uh, is, is this result, which is known as the quadratic reciprocity law. He basically tell you that if, you, if your estimate is P, you are actually not that far off from the actual number of, you are only off by plus or minus one, right? Which is quite striking. And so, so this is, is probably one of the most important results that was uh, proved by Gauss. Um, and the way he did it, he, he was known as uh, someone very, you could say that is a, a, I mean, a computer, right? A living computer. So he would do a lot of experimental calculation and then derive some of his deeper theorem from those type of calculation. So, 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 so basically he compute these kind of huge, huge uh, tables. And then after a while he's able to deduce um, so, some, some deep theorem. And then, so, so that's basically how he, he, he came up with some of these, um, these um these these um statement. So now we have. Uh, so how much time do I have? I think we have like eight nine. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's that's perfect. So 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 now we have the solution, the number of solution over the real. We have the number of solution over the the finite field, and we have the number of solution over the integers. So we want to see if there is any connection between these, these different quantities. And that's where this fact come into play. So I take the, the product of P by NP over all the prime P. So if I do that, then this is what I get. Right? So, so remember, um, AP is just this. So, so if I um, take, um, if I take this and then I divide by, by P, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get this, this expression here. And this expression, because I, I have this, this here, the quadratic reciprocity telling me what the AP look like, I can split this product into two different, two, uh, into uh, the, the congruence class of my prime, right? And so if I do this, I will have the first product on the prime, which are congruence to one modulo P. And then I'll have the classes that are congruent to minus one modulo P. And then, you, so you can expand um, this product by each, for each prime. So you'd have this product and this product. And if you stare out at these two things carefully and you multiply together, you see that you, you, you recover this expression here, which is the famous formula that Labniz used to, to estimate pi, right? So, so this product that we took um, here on those quantities, you get that is pi over four. 
So now we can rewrite this um, this product. So um, we, we take the inverse of this product and if we rewrite it, then we get this. So we have NP over P, this product over all the P is four over pi. And now let's recall that the measure for the solution over the real was two pi and the measure over the integer was four. And so when you put all those two, those things together, you come up with this beautiful formula, right? Isn't that beautiful? So, but I mean, you, you, but we haven't done anything special really. So what we did is we just, it's a reformulation, a reinterpretation of the, the Labniz formula, right? But it turned out that this reformulation is something really, really important in number theory, right? Because what this reformulation is telling you is that if you want, you start with a Diophantine equation and you want to understand the integer, I mean, by definition, a Diophantine equation, we are interested in the integer solution. And this is saying, well, you might be interested in the integer solution, but you actually need to look at the solution in the real, you also need to look at the solution modulo p. And if you understand those things well enough, you will be able to say something about the, <laughs> the, the integer. So, I mean, this sound, it sound like counterintuitive, right? But that's exactly what is happening here. So if you want the solution of this over the z, then we have to look at these two things. And, and this is really one of the, basic principle that is used nowadays in number theory to study this kind of problem. And, and you can actually even go further and try to reformulate this. So if we write, we, we can introduce a notion of L series. It's, it's just, you go back to this product that we saw, and then I define the L series of my circle, which, I, which is C, to be this quantity. So the AP that we have, and this AP, I can call it chi P because I'm trying to define a function. And, and I can actually define a function because I know something which is called the prime factorization th theorem. So I know that every integer will have a unique factorization into a prime. So it means that this product, it makes sense to expand it and if I expand this product, I can use this to define this function chi n. And then chi n will be one for n odd, a square modulo four. It will be zero if n is even, and you'll be minus one if n is um, a non-square. So you are basically extending um, the definition here to all the integers. And what this, um, and, and that gives you this chi here. And what we know is that if we do this by construction, the L series of the curve or the circle will be the L series of this function chi that we define. And it's actually this infinite uh, sum here. And you can actually show that this infinite sum is an analytic function. So it's what we call an entire function. And so what we just saw is that if you want to understand the solution, the integer solution on this unit circle, we can relate, we can characterize this, we can understand that by relating them to a complex function. And if we evaluate that complex function at one, it will tell us something about the number of solutions. And as I said, this is really a guiding principle in number theory that Somehow you want to understand an object which of a geometric nature, namely in our case, the circle, you try to relate them to something which is analytic in the hope that you can, analysis is sometimes easier, but that's the wrong, that's a prejudice. Um, and then you would get some, some, some insight into this. this. And, and this is basically what the Langland philosophy is. So the Langland philosophy is, there are some geometric objects that I want to understand it could come from Diophantine equation and things like that. 
And I relate them to some analytic object, which we call automorphic representation or automorphic form. And if you understand the things on this side, then it will give you uh, some insight on this side. So this, this basic example that I gave is an illustration of this principle. And, and, and just to tell you how important this has become in, in, in number theory, Langland got the, my Canadian fellow, he got uh, the field medal back in 2018 for this work. And, and what Andrew Wilde did to prove the Fermat theorem is to prove a special case of this correspondence. But that, that case in itself was very, it was a huge breakthrough because he introduced a lot of new ideas in order to be able to prove that special case. And since then, people have been exploiting those ideas and proving new cases of the Langland correspondence. So, so my work is basically related to that kind of stuff. I kind of study the Langland correspondence from both um, a theoretical point of view and some algorithmic point of view. And sometimes there are nice applications to Diophantine equation like this one. Um, we basically use the technique of Andrew Weil to prove um, a result of this kind. So, so that's what I wanted to tell you and about my work and my background. And so again, thank you for your invitation. Thank you very much, Lassina, mm -hmm. for an amazing talk, starting from West Africa. <laughs> so, yeah. so you saw everything. <laughs> um, is there, are there any questions? Yes. Thanks again for this beautiful talk. Thank you. I think a lovely example. I do wonder in Oregon and in Cockatoo, I wonder also from the moment. So we have another bit of talk, very, we have another, what would you recommend another easy example, maybe less, less circular? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. so that, that's actually a very good question. So if you take the, right, so if you take the, um, so if you take this one, this one is actually an elliptic curve. And you can do the, exactly the same kind of estimate that I did. And I think in that case, you can actually tell the level of this elliptic curve. So the space of modular form, you can actually... Uh, I, if I remember the levels, I think it might be the CM form uh, at seven, right? I'm not sure, but 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 yeah, it's a very small level, and then of course you can you can show that it will give you that. In this case, you don't have a solution. So of course, this example was known before already, but still, I mean, you can show that everything we computed here, it's work in that case, and and yeah. I think it's actually so. So, so you can actually, you should actually use that. <laughs> Maybe you said you're teaching the modular form course, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if if you need to, I mean, I'm sure you know a bit how to use Sage and Magma, right? So yeah, let me know how it goes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, you can do Pell's equation. Yes, it's the the same. So for Pell's, yeah, actually, yes. So the circle, this is this. You could say that this is a special case of a Pell's equation that I in here d is, d is equal to uh, minus one, right? But yeah, you could repeat the same. So that's actually a very good question because the only then the thing that would be different. So here, this is where your the difference will be. So your congruent would be modular the discriminant which define the Pell's equation. But so you would get the same kind of product here. 
and then here it would be determined by the, the discriminant of your field. And so the character that is here will be the character of this quadratic field. Right? So the character that we have here is the character of the quadratic field Q square root minus one. So, yeah. Question. Um, you made number theory very appealing to me. Ah, that's good. <laughs> that that was my goal. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I told you that my physics professor told me not to study mathematics, right? So, so, so yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yeah, I I think I. I so I think one uh, more um I mean I remember one of my supervisor telling me that um number theory is a bit like the engineers of mathematics, right? So you use all the toolbox, the tool that you have to do stuff. And since I was a bit more inclined to do stuff like an engineer, maybe, <laughs> maybe that was. Maybe that was a natural transition to me. I mean, I'm not saying that to to laugh at engineers. I mean, I'm yeah. I like. Um, I think I was very inclined to become a an engineer if if I if I wasn't if I didn't go into number theory. As a matter of fact, I did try to get into an engineer school back in the Ivory Coast, and the reason I couldn't get into the school is because they said that. Since I was a disabled person, to do some of that engineering work, I would have to stand up and do work. So that's how I. So you see, there's a lot of, of happy accidents. That's why I find myself here, and I'm glad that I convinced you that number theory is beautiful. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Lassina again. Thank you everyone for coming and also the ones who are online. Thanks for speaking. Bye. So if you want the slide, Sorry I can more. give them to Pankash and yeah. send them. Yeah, to sounds you. good. We'll post it on the ADI website with the video okay. as well, which will be formatted in some way, which is yeah. done by the university. Okay. But yeah. I hope that's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. So see you guys all at the reception. Drinks reception outside of the event. Drinks, everyone. Ah. Uh, Okay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Yeah. And if you have any more questions, you can come yeah. here. Thank you. All right. So I can disconnect now. Yeah.